Nie zrośnie. Hi, Pravesh. Welcome. Oh, I didn't hear <laughs> Ashish. Yes, we are live right now. Uh, and I'll just be introducing everyone. This is a completely new. Um, sorry, I haven't been on this. Uh, um, whatever technology air meet. It's a new platform. <laughs> it's air meet. It's it's very good. Yeah. But I think people aren't familiar with it. Competitor We're of Zoom, on is stage. It? Yes, actually not quite. It's more only for conferences. We are actually live right now with the audience. So I'm going to introduce the session, and all of you. Uh, give me a couple of minutes to start. So. For the audience, my name is Ashish Karamchandani. I work with the Center for Rural Development at the Nudge, and I'd like to welcome you to today's twin session. The first of these is on FPOs and the future of FPOs, and the second one is actually about FDRVC, which is a special kind of FPO, a new effort with some pretty interesting options and ambitions, which Alok Day and Jugal Kishorji Mohapatra will speak about after this session. It's a fireside chat after the session. But first of all, why FPOs? Why in the rural development track do we have a session of FPOs? Well, the bottom line of rural development at some level is agri. Even when we talk of non-agri sectors like transport, etc., they hinge back to agriculture. It is agricultural produce, inputs, even people who work in agriculture who access hospitals, etc., that require transport. So the center of rural India today is agriculture. And I don't need to tell everybody in this audience about the challenges that, that a small and marginal farmers face, which are whether it is small land holdings, whether it is spurious inputs, whether it is access to credit, everything is a challenge for them. And one of the challenges for dealing with smallholder farmers is their unit economics. They're small individuals. And therefore, the economics of engaging with them makes it difficult. And their bargaining power is also very low. So the whole idea of an FPO is an aggregation of small farmers, which actually gives them both the buying power and the collective power, as well as makes it easier to access them economically than as individuals. And the concept of an FPO has been well understood by the government. In fact, we're very fortunate here. I'll come back to that as some of the people speaking. But there's been a strong push from the government to actually support this concept. At the same time, things have not gone that well. So today's session is really to help think through, understand some of the advantages of FPOs, but more importantly, look at the future of FPOs. And we're very fortunate that we actually have some very fascinating speakers who will give us both a little bit of the history of FPOs, give us the broader context of farmers and doubling farmer income, and actual experience on the ground of interacting with farmers. I'm going to introduce the panel. We have had a last minute dropout. Uh, Srimati Nilkamal Darwariji is not well, and so she's had to drop out. But we are very fortunate that we have Pravesh Sharmaji, who used to be the head of SFAC. And so he can also give us some of the context behind SFAC, which we were hoping that Neil Kamalji would do. With that, let me introduce the speakers. Um, we will start with Sri Ashok Dalwai, uh, who's currently the CEO of the National Rainfed Area Authority. Uh, he has had an illustrious career in the IAS, and he's been responsible for a number of real innovations, and has also got extensive experience in the agricultural space, including working on agricultural markets. He was also the chairperson of the Interministerial Committee on Doubling Farmers' Income and did the underlying work there of developing the strategy and has now been tasked to supervise its implementation as the chairman of the Empowered Body. Thank you, Ashokji, for joining us today. We're really looking forward to your setting the context of the need from a farmer perspective before we really move into FPOs. And then, of course, we're going to grill you on FPOs because we know you have a lot of experience on the market side also. Uh, post that, we'll have um, Sri Pravesh Sharma speak. He's again been in the IS for 34 years, so a real veteran of the service. But what's interesting is while he did spend 20 years in the IS, in the agriculture space, including five years as the founding MD of FSAC, where he helped create 750 FPOs, after that, he started Kamata, an agri-tech startup 
that integrates FPOs with markets. So he has actual on the ground experience of working with FPOs and integrating them into markets. He at Kamatan he's worked with over 300 FPOs. And so he'll bring a unique perspective of both the government side of setting up FPOs and promoting them and the actual practical side of working with them on the ground. Pravesh, thank you very much. And also appreciate your doubling up with both hats today, the SFAC hat and the market hat dealing with FPOs. The third speaker that we have today is uh, Srimati Usha Devi Venkatachalam. She is the founder and CEO of Krishi Janini, a farmer network and marketplace. It focuses on regenerating the soil and environment while ensuring value for the farmer. She's got a fascinating background, over 20 years of experience with software and tech, architecting sustainable, culture-specific, and locally appropriate technology solutions in resource-constrained environments, and her family's agricultural background, which she has used to create Janini. Um, as part of Janini, she engages with farmers in different ways, as individuals, as FPOs, as SHGs, and therefore she'll share from her ground observations some of the benefits that she sees of FPO, the potential she sees of FPOs, as well as some of the challenges. Thank you, Ushaji, for joining us today. With that, I'm going to open up and ask Ashokji to share his thoughts. Incidentally, the format will be, I'll go around and ask everybody to share their thoughts for maybe about eight to 12 minutes. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience, as well as some more questions that I think as we move around will naturally come up in the conversation. Ashokji, over to you. Thank you, Ashishji. Good morning to you. It's my privilege to be sharing the platform with my dear friend Pravesh and Ushaji. The topic, of course, is very relevant for the day. As I have been tasked to give a context for the relevance of farmer producers organization in the farmer producer organization in the context of income. Sorry, I got disturbed because mobile. So I'll share a few thoughts on that. As you rightly said, agriculture must be taken as the current and the future. We must have trust in the conviction that agriculture is here to stay. And I can substantiate that by saying that we are now moving to bioeconomy or we need to move to the bioeconomy. Given the context of climate change, which has run for the last 250 years by utilizing the fossil resources, causing emission of large quantities of greenhouse gases that has caused global warming. We now need to move towards a more sublime form of resources and raw materials to keep our industrial revolution, the modern economy, and the civilization taking. I can see that agriculture has that potential to continuously provide for the raw materials in a renewable form. The second one is, given the context of the 21st century India, where the population is going to be huge, where the people demanding for jobs in the lower age group or the younger age group is going to be large, Creating jobs and incomes related to jobs is going to be the most important mandate for any government or the society. We cannot see the possibility of shifting manpower from agriculture to non-agriculture on account of the new technology that is more labor substituting than, and than labor generating. Of course, there has been a common understanding that every new technology is a disruptor, but it also creates its own new jobs. That may be true, but I think the ratio of jobs that we created will not be proportionate to the number of new minds and hands asking for jobs. 
therefore we must begin with the premise that agricultural growth rate has to be maintained at a robust level so that we are generating wealth for the people alongside creating jobs gainful jobs and also food and nutrition security for our people if this is to happen we need to reimagine agriculture sector agriculture of india dominated by the small and marginal farmers will continue to be so and there could be further division and secondly agriculture needs to be reimagined as a supporter of the new economy and not just as a producer of food and nutrition for our growing population which is very important rather it's a moral responsibility of agriculture sector simultaneously there is going to be competition from other sectors of the economy the industry and infrastructure habitation and other aspects of new life which will ask for the same piece of land we cannot divert land from forest areas we cannot divert land from common property resources like pasture lands or the water bodies the only option is to divert a small portion of the agriculture land which becomes inevitable in that context the implication is how do we generate all that we need at a higher proportion from the lowering extent of arable land there comes the issue of deploying science and technology which will achieve higher productivity at lower cost of resource use in an eco friendly manner so if we are talking about welfare of the people it is welfare of the farmers because they constitute the centerpiece of the population of india welfare is linked to incomes the purchasing power now that we have low incomes low purchasing power and the farmers and the landless agriculture labor are not able to meet all the requirements that are necessary for a dignified living which has been highlighted particularly in the last one and a half years of covid we need to refocus with reemphasis on generating higher incomes an income approach to agriculture is nothing but an enterprise approach an enterprise means generating profits and profits are generated based on the three basic principles of any enterprise first is we achieve higher production from through the route of higher productivity second one is we do so at lower cost of production that means resource use efficiency and higher total factor productivity and the third one of course is monetizing efficiently the agriculture produce generated by the farmers in different sub sectors and these three things will call for scales of economy the scales of economy are necessary because we need to adopt appropriate technology and keep abreast of the technology that will keep emerging we need to adopt modern management practices which means that we should have input use efficiency and output use output management efficiently if all of this is to happen naturally we need to bring the small and marginal farmers together and work through collectivization or cooperativization the term collectivization is a little it, it raises uh, hackles because then we will go to another model so we have now realized the best way out is while maintaining the ownership of the farms or other forms of assets whether it's cattle or water bodies or all other kinds of assets that the farmer may have while retaining the ownership and the right to possession among the farmers we allow them to work together at input management and output management level therefore the farmer producers organization of different nature become very critical now whether producers organizations which are being tested in this country for a long time will they really succeed in india is the question i think we need to draw lessons from other countries including european union where over the last 40 years the producers organization ha, organizations have been experimented very successfully and have been scaled up today in europe european union we have almost 254 producers organization for every 1 million of farm households at that rate india will require at least 40000 producers organizations and not just 10000 that we are starting with but given the fact that we have larger number of farmers coming together on account of the small size of the farms and unlike in european union we may have to have one producers organization for every 1000 farm households at that rate 
if 140 million is our arable land, if 120 million farmers are there in our country, we will require at least 1 lakh 20,000 a number of farm, uh, farm producers organization. So if this is going to be the scale, this magnitude is so high, how do we create that environment for the producers organizations to succeed? What we have seen so far is the failure is an account of absence of certain essentials. And the first essential is that how do we create an environment for every member to be a democratically chosen member who, including the democratically elected leader, such that these people find that there is equality or equitability in the decision making process. I think the biggest challenge, according to me, in making any producer organization succeed is to create that democratic environment within this organization such that every member feels that he has a say in the decision making. And that particular say is linked closely to the transparency. Many a time, the opaqueness comes because there are some greedy elements within the producers organization or any cooperative where they try to make a profit for themselves. So the way to maintain that transparency is to adopt new technology. One of the best technologies that we can adopt, of course, is digital technology. And within that digital technology framework, the blockchain technology, I think, which is an open ledger system, would be very, very critical such that every member, including the executive committee, knows what are the entries and what are the exits from there. So the money, the assets created, etc., are all known to everybody. So if we are able to bring the transparency in the asset management, finance management, decision making becomes that much more transparent and therefore the probability of people getting sticking together will rise. This is not to say that we don't need to build the capacities or create that emotional uh, element in them that there is strength in unity and therefore cooperativization is the only way forward. The second of course weakness so far we've seen is not giving enough to this producers organization. When you say not giving enough to producers organization, Many a time our approach has been what is called a charity orientation. That means if somebody needs to be 10,000, we give 1,000 and we distribute that little money among everybody. That means there's not enoughness. So we need to make a business plan for every producer organization on strictly enterprise level, uh, phenomena and meet all the requirements, whether it is a credit, whether it is infrastructure, whether it is linkage to uh, inputs, linkage to output management, all elements of the agriculture value chain must be brought in uh, and through capacity building, make them aware and strengthen them such that they're able to uh, actually adopt the management practices. So that is the second one I would like to say. The third one is, of course, enabling the management to choose appropriate business uh, opportunities. It is not necessary that every producer organization opts for the same thing. They must go by their own strengths and weaknesses, which will be determined the nature of raw materials, the nature of market, the, the, the proximity of the market, the ability to integrate to the value chain. So based on the analysis of all these business factors, we should be able to help the producer organization to actually choose that particular activity that is appropriate. Now we know that can we make the producer organization in-house competent? Not necessary. If we try to make every producer organization in-house competent, that means it has everything that is required, then we'll be creating, introducing inefficiency because capital investment will go up and then it is not possible for them to achieve a return and investment that is profitable. So I, I think just on the lines of custom hiring centers for farm mechanization, for example, we need to provide a bank for every group of producer organization in close proximity where certain services, including management services or uh, linkage with the external markets. These kind of services are made available to every producer organization and producer organization acquires only those minimum facilities which are required, for example, to aggregate, to do primary processing or uh, to buy their inputs at, at scale. So minimal business principles, they, uh, business uh, facilities they acquire, but the major business facilities are available as a service as a service through a bigger organization which can manage. Because here, when you talk about the manager, a manager, an efficient manager will come for every producer organization, provided he gets paid properly. Now, every PO is not capable of paying. 
So how do we continuously upgrade the skills and capacities of the producer organization is another issue. So I would say that if income approach, not just doubling farmers income, let's call generically as income approach to agriculture, income appro approach to agriculture calls for increasing productivity. So new technology is required, reducing cost of production. Therefore, again, new technology, new management practices are required. And then linkage to the market as a post harvest stage uh, so that we reduce the waste stage and monetize the maximum quantity of the produce. But once again, we require an, a, a policy framework which is liberalized and simultaneously the farmers are taken care of. Because at the post harvest, before I close, I must say it is not the price alone that matters. In fact, the monetization is a function of price and the volume of produce that you're able to sell. We should help the farmers to sell maximum rather than achieve the highest price that they can get. So today, because there's a wastage of 20 to 30 percent. So if we can achieve that kind of integration through the value chain uh, into the market, uh, that is possible only through the producer organization. So I would close by saying that, yes, producers organizations are inevitable, given the fact that we're continuing to dis uh, fragment our properties. And the only way from the global experience is that we can achieve scales of economy, which is so essential to adopt new technologies, but simultaneously an agriculture that is reimagined, not just to produce food, but to also produce raw materials for the bioprocessing, bioenzymes, biomaterials, and become part of the new bioeconomy, such that we're able to create new demands for our agriculture produce. And therefore, the price is going to be more buoyant because of the new demand and new supply. So I will stop here and then we will uh, take it through the Q&A subsequently. Thank you very much. Ashokji, thank you very much for a very interesting framing of the problem. I think the whole idea that agriculture is one of the few ways of getting renewable resources and therefore should be thought as a core anchor to the next millennium is something which I think is a really great way of framing the whole context in that putting in the fact that we have an obligation to the smallholder farmer to actually increase incomes, the role of FPOs in doing that. At the same time, they're actually being democratic, the opportunity for being transparent and using technology to do that. Uh, very, very interesting perspectives on it. And last but not the least, the very pragmatic recognition that an FPO cannot do anything. And we need to think of ways of having support services for them, just like we have for uh, uh, equipment bank for farmers. We need a bank of that kind. And I'm really excited about the way you laid this out, Ashokji, because I think Pravesh will both pick up the concept of FPOs, where they came from, and then with his Kamatan hat, actually show a way of providing these services. And Ushaji, who's actually working on regenerative principles, will also again pick up and share some thoughts on the technology and the democratization front. So thank you very much for framing this in a way that I think is going to make it very relevant for our next two speakers. With that, I'm going to ask Pravesh ji to share his thoughts both on the broader framework of FPOs from the SFAC hat and then what are the challenges that they face and how can they be met using his Kamatan hat. Pravesh ji, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ashish, and uh, congratulations to Nudge for focusing on this uh, very, I would say, essential theme of uh, our times, because you can't today talk about the challenge that Indian agriculture is facing and not talk about the solution or the pro potential for a solution that uh, a collective, which we, in a generic we call the FPO, the farmer producer organization, which can include any form. It doesn't have to be only one legal form of producer companies. I think the cooperative form today, even the SHG or the <clears throat> informal federations of producers, they are as much FPOs as uh, other forms. And I think um, I completely agree with you. Ashok has set a very useful context and thrown some challenges which uh, I think quite appropriately are going to define what you have uh, you know, headlined as the FPO 2.0. Um, but when you say FPO 2.0, we are assuming that there was an FPO 1.0 phase, okay? And that 
in a sense that phase has either ended or is um, close to ending. And therefore, we, we must now prepare for 2.0, the next phase of growth and development of FPOs. And since you also, you know, um, forced me to dig out an old dusty hat, which I have given up. Um, so of course, I cannot speak on behalf of SFAC. Um, but I will certainly share some thoughts uh, on how um, the, you know, concept of farmer collectives was in a sense revived because it would be inappropriate to say that we invented FPOs, you know, in the early uh, years of the last decade, 2010 is when I joined SFAC. Uh, it would be very presumptuous and dishonest of me to say that I created the idea. I certainly had the privilege of building on the idea of collectives that has existed in our country before independence. I think that uh, a lot of people in your audience may not be aware that the Anand cooperative, the milk cooperative predates independence and was actually launched by Sardar Vallabhai Patel. And they wanted to break into the lucrative Bombay milk market, which was controlled by British companies at that time. And the challenges they faced and the various hurdles that were put in the way of this collective. So the idea of the collective is certainly as old as uh, we can say independent India. And initially in the late 50s, as again, many youngsters on the audience may not know, the institutional solution to agriculture through cooperatives was an integral part of the entire agricultural development strategy. And it was supposed to accompany the abolition of zamindari, the you know land to the tiller movement. I'm not going to dwell too much on that history because we know that various events occurred to, in a sense, interrupt that uh, progress or movement. But since 1947, as our democracy has grown, deepened, um, and has embedded itself in processes, not just within the state, but also within civil society, also within corporations, um, I would say the idea of participation for common good has remained in different forms, in different legal expressions, or certainly within the um, core space of civil society. Uh, Usha Devi ji is here and I'm looking forward to listening to her. I'm aware of her work and of many other similar civil society organizations who have worked consistently, even when collectives were not perhaps um, the recipients of the kind of official or state patronage, which may have been required at a particular point of time. So even when, let's say in the decade of the 70s and 80s, when food security concerns uh, shifted the policy focus onto technology as the panacea, as the solution to all the challenges of agriculture, and certainly it has delivered on that front, but um, the core challenge of ensuring viable returns to that small enterprise, which is the small farmer who predominates our agricultural economy, that challenge has remained. So this is where the idea of the collective was in a sense revived because when the green revolution technologies in a sense exhausted their potential and we saw that that potential was limited to the better resource endowed areas where the soil or water conditions were more favorable and that the green revolution technologies were not an appropriate answer to the livelihood challenges that agriculture faced in rain-fed and arid regions. We started looking for different solutions. Um, and I uh, had the privilege of working in a state like Madhya Pradesh, which despite very, uh, I would say, rich resource endowment in terms of land and water and a very favorable land to man ratio, had this challenge also of poor infrastructure, poor connectivity, and producers who were languishing at the bottom of the you know, 
agri value chains. So I'll, um, you know, say in summary that the imperative of the collective can be summed up with three, um, I would say, major arguments. A, the importance of the farmers collective in India is a unique challenge, is an answer to a unique challenge, which is the presence of the world's largest farming cohort. Nowhere else in the world do you have over 60% of the population today dependent on agriculture and the agricultural economy. And nowhere else in the world you have something over 12 crore, that's 120 million farm households. That's, as we all know, bigger than the population of many, many countries in the world. That's the first imperative. The second imperative is the political economy model that we adopted since independence. And this is not a forum to debate that, but the reality is that we decided for various reasons to have a closed economy model for certainly the first 40, 45 years of our independence. And that had a direct impact on agriculture. Uh, agriculture goods were the only goods that we produced uh, in a competitive manner in 1947. While in industry and services, our goods were not competitive in world markets, but we had to close our markets to answer our needs for food security. But the result was that we had 40 years of negative terms of trade in agriculture. And there are so many studies which have now established this with very robust data. Ashok chaired a committee, as we all know, which produced a very, um, substantial amount of evidence and uh, in the context of doubling farmers income, we uh, have come to realize that certainly for the first 40 years or so, we have implicitly taxed agriculture at around 15% of the overall agriculture GDP value. On an average, there have been variations, some years have actually been very bad, but um, that's one of the reasons why capital formation did not take place in agriculture. But as I said, that's the number two reason. And the third reason is that despite all the progress in absorption of technology, and I mean agriculture production technologies, the technological divide in our agriculture is still massive. And the reason why in 2021, we are still talking about things like machinery banks and custom hiring centers is itself an admission that the productivity gains that the average farmer of a similar holding size, of a similar holding size, I insist, which have been seen in Southeast Asia in our neighborhood. I'm not talking about, you know, Western Europe and America, which has a very different context. But I'm saying the similar land size productivity in Southeast Asia and China has not been witnessed in India because of the uh, inability of our average smallholder to access these technologies. So I would say these three deficits the deficit on, I would not call it a deficit, I would say the challenge of these large numbers, these 12 crore households. Number two, the uh, reversing the negative effects of the political economy model of the first 40 years. And thirdly, this large technological divide that still exists in our agriculture. This is what uh, justifies or makes the uh, importance of pharma collectives today in today's context as relevant as it was in 1947. And when I speak of technology, and especially since Usha Deviji is going to speak and I know of our work, I would say today, even going beyond production and mechanization and preservation of produce is the challenge of quickly embedding technologies to cope with the, I call it the oncoming super cyclone of climate change. It is no more a gradual and, you know, far off event, it's hurtling towards us like a super cyclone and it's gonna hit us. It's actually already hitting us uh, in the way the rainfall patterns, the excessive rainfall events and long dry periods in certain, the West has seen the Northern part of Canada uh, has seen wildfires, which could not have been imagined even a decade ago. So let me not labor that point. Um, now let me come to this, you know, your topic and try and address uh, very briefly because I am conscious that we need to hear the others. Um, 
what did FPO 1.0 achieve? And I could re reel out a dozen things, but I'm going to only limit myself to four things, three positives and one negative. Ashok mostly dwelt on the negatives, but I think that it's also important to acknowledge the positives. So the number one positive from my point of view is the idea of the FPO is now firmly embedded in our policy consciousness. When I began this work in 2010, Ashok joined the ministry a little later, but colleagues like him, whenever I would speak, they would interrupt and say, excuse me, what does the term FPO stand for? Okay, fair enough. It was a new term I was trying to push because I wanted to distinguish the cooperative and the FPO. We now have tweets from the Honorable Prime Minister onwards supporting FPOs, talking about FPOs, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, on a you know daily basis, I notice, because there are people um, who now I can put to track these things. And we typically collect more than 100 plus reference to FPOs in the news space every day, of course, all, across all media, websites, portals, tweets, etc. So I'm just trying to point this out as proof of my assertion that the idea of the FPO is now firmly embedded and when I say the FPO, I of course mean the concept of the pharma collective. That's, I would say, a great achievement of FPO 1.0. Number two, the policy ecosystem has responded handsomely, especially in the last five years. Yes, it took five to six years to convince everybody. Um, in SFAC, I, you know, when I worked on the pilot, we decided that we must promote at least two FPOs in every state of this country. I promoted FPO in Jammu Kashmir as also every state of the Northeast. In the Northeast, I would have to go and actually meet chief ministers and convince them that this is not something which is subversive. It is not something which is going against any farmer. But the term company, the producer company, it was the source of so much confusion and so much, I would say, doubt. Anyway, we are beyond that. So I would say the policy ecosystem today with supposed FPOs, the 10,000 FPO project is certainly the latest example. And so much um, policy support from the RBI, from the banking system, from the government, uh, including state governments. Uh, nine state governments have specific FPO promotion policies today. More than 15 states have externally aided projects where FPO building is a core component. So I, I think need not labor this point too. And the third, uh, in my view, positive outcome of 1.0 is the increasing, and I say increasing, I'm not saying we are there yet, the increasing interest of industry in integrating with FPOs in different value chains. There are some very good examples. All of us are aware of that. We won't spend time talking about specifics, but um, you know, they're there out there in the public domain. <clears throat> the biggest lacuna of FPO 1.0, in my view, is that the three core objectives that we need to address in our agriculture, which is number one, how do we improve access of farmers to capital? Number two, how do we improve their access to technology? And number three, how do we improve their access to markets? So access to capital technology and markets is still far from optimal. We are still very, very far from where we should be. And in a sense, this is uh, you know, a no brainer to set the agenda for FPO 2.0, if you would have it that way. And I'm gonna close now because I need to you know, get off your podium and allow Usha ji and the others to speak. Um, three things I see as essential to the next phase of growth of FPOs. And I completely take on board all the issues that Ashok has outlined. And I think that those issues definitely need to be addressed in a central manner to keep the idea of the FPO alive and to actually make it prosper and grow. So the first thing that is important now is that we need to move beyond simply institution building to building FPOs that can integrate in specific agri value chains. We need to build capabilities, not just for account keeping. And I completely agree that if the top multinational corporations of the world can outsource their 
non core activities to back offices in chennai so can the fpo uh, hive off a number of functions and focus on its core function of aggregating quality agri produce for consumers across different value chains and for that we'll have to perhaps reorient the way we are building our fpos we can discuss details maybe another time the second thing which i think needs to happen for the first to happen actually there's a second condition and that is we need to find innovative ways to open investment into fpos when i say investment into fpos the primary reason that fpos have not been able to leverage their potential is their inability to raise sufficient equity and working capital like any business enterprise when i began with this idea of the startup um i had uh, zero money i had decided that uh, i'm not going i don't have the sort of bandwidth to even invest uh, 10 lakhs of my retirement money into this idea so i'm going to wait till i can raise money before i take this further and of course over a period of time uh, with the you know interest of investors we could take this enterprise off i'm saying today the fpo has not taken off because we do not have solutions to investment in equity and working capital again we can discuss many ways farmers can't be expected to bring lakhs or crores or rupees as equity we'll have to look at solutions like subordinate debt we'll have to look at the solutions like um, you know um uh, soft venture debt we may have to look at uh, philanthropic capital being allowed to be invested in fpos so that they can leverage the sufficiently required working capital and the third point uh, which will be my my last point is that i foresee the success of fpos truly taking off when we see industry and not the government alone investing in fpos why is it that only public money needs to be invested in creating this organizational platform if it's important to integrate farmers in value chains then i as an industry player whether i am a processor i am an exporter or i am a value addition player i need to see that i should invest in this collective of producers to help them achieve that capability in terms of technological absorption in terms of access to capital and then share the um and again i'm not saying something which has not been done the we have two wonderful examples in this country in milk and in sugar where producers on an average receive around 2/3 of the consumer price of these products why has this not happened in other products that's a question i think that fpo 2.0 needs to ask and my final sentence um, i'm also very privileged to now work with another great startup which began along with us called samunati we now have a formal partnership and on this joint platform i can assure you that some of these things i have talked about are actually being now implemented we have launched something called fpo next which is to pick up 100 fpos and take them from where they are to at least a 5x of where they were in about 2 years time we are similarly ashok talked about blockchain and maybe i am making an advance as uh, intimation uh, samunati and another player are launching the first blockchain initiative for fpos tomorrow on independence day uh, in tamil nadu but maybe more of that some other time thank you so much for this platform thank you so much for allowing me to share my thoughts pravesh thank you very much for both sort of bringing the context of collectivization and the strong acknowledgement for the history of collectivization in the country and at the same time some of the challenges that have happened i'm not going to try to summarize your uh, points because they were way too good and i don't need to i think the points though of the need for collectivization even today the second one about fpos really needing to integrate into value chains and the third one of thinking about other ways of getting capital and resources into fpos including industry are very powerful i'm going to now ask usha ji to share her perspectives of a player who actually has a marketplace and interacts with different kinds of modes of farmers from individuals to self help groups to fpos to share some of her thoughts and also just by way of context as i mentioned right in the beginning she has a dual purpose here one is actually regeneration so 
um, agro practices that regenerate the soil and the ecosystem, as well as helping the farmer. Usha ji, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, let me do a quick time check uh, so that I leave at least a little bit of time for question and answers. Uh, Actually, Ushaji, I think it's important to get your perspective. So if you could share your perspectives in about eight, 10 minutes, that would be great. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. I'm, I apologize. I'm dialing in from a rural broadband and so have some bandwidth issues. Um, so I apologize for keeping my video off, first off. Uh, thank you, Ashish. Uh, thank you to the Nudge team and thanks to my esteemed panelists. I uh, want to start off by saying I am coming from a specific context. So before uh, I explain the, uh, what our experience has been, I want to uh, make sure that we understand the, our experience is not uh, unique. At the same time, our experience is not general across the country. We uh, are based in Tamil Nadu. We work with farmers. Uh, it's a marketplace that helps farmers transition to regenerative agriculture by connecting them to consumers and companies looking to source high quality organic products. So we are a small social enterprise startup. Um, and so for us, all our perspectives and biases come from that particular angle. What I want to uh, sort of while we speak about FPO 1.0 and FPO 2.0, I want to sort of bring some of our experiences on the ground into the mix and talk about it from a specific farmer group in particular, right? So we can make it a little bit real and um, you know understand the pressures on the farmers and on the groups, collectivized groups. Uh, so we are working with about 10,000 plus farmers, um, of which only 3% are organic. Most of them are not certified organic. And of which I will take an even smaller group of 12 organic turmeric farmers who uh, grow, Erod has a GI, uh, you know, GI tag even for uh, turmeric. So they grow Erod and Salem variety turmeric in the Erod region. So when I talk about farmer producer organizations, the first point we want to make clear is that many of the farmers that work with us are also members of one or more of farmer groups. So they are a member of an FPO, they work with some um, FIGs, so they may be processing through SHGs, all these alphabet soup of collectivization. The, the, the major, so I am going to uh, sort of present my um, experience in the form of questions, which uh, if we address them would hopefully be the sort of uh, the foundation for FPO 2.0. So when we speak about collectivization, the question that we have, the question that we see hasn't been answered clearly in FPO 1.0 is in this collectivization process, who owns that collective? Who makes decisions for that collective? How are risks and rewards distributed and enjoyed? Right? Those four critical areas I want to cover a little bit. So when we talk about collectivization, there, uh, so one of the uh, biggest sort of our experience, learning experience has been, Collectivization does not automatically lead to market power. You can have a thousand farmers in a collective and still not have the market power to set prices when they come to sell their harvest because of various reasons. Uh, for one, they are small and uh, you know there are multiple players and they don't have the liquidity. So they, are, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of pressure to sell right away and all these various things. But even more importantly than that, there is a question of most of the FPOs have promoters and certain some large farmers who actually have joined together and then brought in a pool of mid-sized farmers and smaller farmers. So the voices of the promoters and the voices of the large farmers still play a key role in this collectivization. Is there a way for the promoters, especially if they are 
uh, because the farmers pay something like say the together form the uh, paid up capital which as uh, pravesh ji men mentioned earlier they are not going to be accessing uh, external de debt or credit or equity markets so the paid up capital is the financial base they have and the promoters are the professional support they have promoters are usually civil society organizations and ngos so in this case when we talk about collectivization the one experience has been that it does not automatically result in market power and the second experience that we have seen on the ground is that the ownership is not democratic or participatory or distributed primarily because there are many other levers socio cultural uh, backgrounds and um, barriers that come into this democrat democratization and participatory process so that's question number 1 the second question along with the collectivization question is then the farmer producer organization or a shg sets up an entity sets up an enterprise with a handful of people running that enterprise but most of the times because they are only drawing upon the paid up capital or some grants that the promoters have raised what happens is the professional expertise that a large entity or a, a large corporate corporation or even a, say a funded startup like us have access to this collective does not have access to so when we talk about the second problem in fpo 1.0 the professionalization for example i'll take this 12 member organic turmeric group as a as a example they uh, two years ago we helped them get pgs india certified so they have they have certi they have been certified they now have a higher quality turmeric uh, you know for this region the general uh, curcumin content is about 2.5% their turmeric is about 3.8% uh, curcumin content but this 12 member group has about 40 tons of turmeric to sell right so it's going to be distributed among different market channels somebody has to sell to some of the consumer uh, directly to consumers perhaps somebody has to sell to say masala companies somebody has to sell to pharmaceutical companies which are seeking high quality a uh, turmeric for curcumin oil or something like that and each of those market channels require a different set of skills a different set of relationships a different set of approach so with the fpo and the paid up capital and the smaller pool of expertise that they have um most of the ceos for fpo ceos that we have worked with have about 2 to 3 years experience in the field um so there is a very severe lack of the skills and the expertise needed for them to sell that 40 ton of turmeric now multiply that by the number of farmers the number of fpos the number of shgs farmer interest groups so how can we enable fpo 2.0 to have professional staff that can also make data driven decisions right so is for example if i am able to predict that uh, i have a horticultural fpo if i am able to predict that in 3 months turmeric prices turmeric or uh, tomato or uh, some of the more commodity crops if the price is going to fall can i make a data based decision to say let us not do turmeric let us do something else let us not do tomato let's do something else right all of that requires an agro agronomy expertise a uh, marketing expertise all of which the fpos do not have access to how so the second question i have is how can fpo 2.0 make these uh, professional skills and staff available to the small producer groups the third sort of a uh, related problem to the collectivization i mentioned is about financialization right financialization alone cannot and will not lead to doubling farmer incomes so i think all of us on this panel understand that the challenge is still in the rural market as well as in any other market people who have access to liquid liquidity and cash 
will have the power to set market prices. They have the power to buy and hold on to goods. Small farmers will not have that capability. Even a farmer producer organization may not have that capability. So how can we financialize in such a way that rewards, meaning higher prices at certain points of time in the year, during the year, how can those rewards be equitably distributed along the value chain in such a way that the farmer community benefits as a whole and the farmer producer organization is able to specialize and become better and better. Right? So that's the third sort of question and solution that I would suggest for FPO 2.0. The fourth one, of course, is sort of the, the, the challenge that we see today. I think all of us are aware of climate crisis that is bearing down upon us. The recent IPCC report even has waved the code red on all of us. The challenge is if climate crisis is the biggest risk that our farmers are facing, what are the mitigation strategies that an FPO or even at a collective level, the regional administration or the state administration or the national administration, who has the capacity to do that risk mitigation for these extreme weather situations and extreme climate patterns. We are in uh, rural Tamil Nadu and sometimes we uh, have completely different rainfall patterns within 10 kilometers of uh, one village to the other, right? So if, for example, if uh, farmers had purchased insurance, uh, crop insurance, how are we even going to uh, uh, mitigate this risk if rainfall patterns had uh, are this extreme within the same geographical region? Right? So for us, regeneration in this context comes from building the health and wealth of soil and water. And we see that as a fundamental, fundamental thing that we have to do before the other three we can address, right? So if we are not ready, if we are not ready for the climate crisis, how can we do the FPO 2.0? So for us, uh, as I said, I come from this particular bias and regeneration, regenerating soil and water in such a way that even if there is a downpour of rain in say one hour, like the one Chennai faced a couple of years ago, we still are able to absorb that water, store it underground, and make it available both as drinking water and irrigation water at a, another point in time during summer when we face water scarcity. That type of regeneration practices will an FPO be able to undertake? Why should the FPO undertake? Who is going to fund these regeneration activities? Isn't it, if it is considered public good, isn't it the responsibility of the entire public, and I'm including the government, the people who are consumers of the food, people who are companies who are making value-added production from the food, shouldn't all of them be involved in that risk mitigation, uh, adopting regenerative practices? Why should small farmers or any farmer be the person facing the brunt of climate crisis, right? So these are, again, I'll repeat the, all the four sort of questions as well as suggestions for FPO 2.0. Collectivization in and of itself will not lead to unity or market power. So how can the FPO 2.0 enable that? FPO 1.0, in our experience, is a very good starting initiative, starting point. But then we have to keep building off of that one of the very valuable uh, lessons from nature and regeneration is that you keep building uh, a system, you keep evolving a system based on feedback from the system itself. So if we took all of these as feedback into the system, how will we create a FPO 2.0 that focuses on collectivization in a way that's truly participatory and truly democratic? How can we enable SPOs in such a way that they have access to professional expertise, resources, and how can rewards be distributed in such a way that financialization does not 
again go into reinforcing existing sociocultural hierarchies, sociocultural or economic hierarchies? How can financialization lead to equitable distribution of rewards? And finally, the most critical of all, how can farming, farming communities through FPO 2.0 or other means, how can they face climate crisis and the risks associated with that? Um, so with that, I want to sort of pass it back to uh, Ashish. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Ushaji, thank you very much for the perspectives you brought and I think the actual journey on the ground and the points you make. What is interesting for me as an observer and having the privilege of hearing all the three of you is the commonalities in what you spoke about. Right from when Ashok started with laying the broader context of the fact that agriculture can actually be the source of the next power of our economy and not just be looked upon as a laggard uh, through all the points. And in fact, what I've taken away is, first of all, there's no question amongst anyone on this panel about the need for collectivization. The second point is to really be effective. It has to actually integrate in with value chains. The third is there's a need for democratization of the FPO. Maybe it's through technology and transparency, but somewhere that needs to be very clear for it to actually be effective. The next point was one about the fact that an FPO does not have to do everything. There are options where the FPO focuses on engaging with the farm on the production side, and there is a professional help, other linkages to markets, etc., which can be provided by a separate organization. In fact, very much like what Kamatan and Samunati are doing right now. The next piece which was interesting was if you're integrating into value chains, there are industries and formal sectors. How do we bring them in? to actually participate and support this whole thing, whether it's finance, whether it's professional help. And I think that's a really interesting thread which has come out of this conversation. And lastly, but not the least, climate change, both as a positive and as a negative. The negative is what everybody emphasizes. And that's what sort of uh, was being talked about as the super cyclone that uh, Pravesh mentioned. But I want to tail back to the point where Ashok started. It's also climate change that is going to be what will actually allow us to use agri as the new resource base and move away from the fossil economy that all of us are used to. So with that, I'd like to thank the panelists. Really appreciate your insights. I'm sorry we did not have enough time for questions from the audience. And I know there are quite a few, uh, but apologize on um, behalf of the organizers for not being able to manage that. And once again, thank you very much, Ushaji, Ashokji, and Pravesh. With that, I'd like to close this panel. And I do encourage you all to attend the next session, which is a fireside chat on FDRVC, which is taking a new look at FPOs and how they can be done, addressing some of the challenges of FPOs 1.0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.